problem. <laughs> Uh, I'd um, love to go and repeat everything I just said, <laughs> but I don't think I can. <laughs> well, I, I can do a quick recap here since I was the one with the tech <laughs> difficulty. So, you know, step one, manual LinkedIn step, and that's really going to work towards, you know, name recognition. So when they get that first email from you, it's going to kind of, you know, trigger them um, in terms of the sender. So they're probably more likely to open that email. And then for that step two, day one email, um, it's just really having a friendly conversational tone um, and, you know, utilizing questions, um, you know, about a specific obstacle or specific pain point or something like that to open those lines of communication. Exactly. So I, th I think that was a good summary. <laughs> it took me, it took me eight minutes to get there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yes, so you, again, friendly conversational style, the closer you can get to the idea of you sitting down, writing this out for those individuals, the better off you're going to be. Um, it, a lot of people that I hop on calls with, um, the only question that they end up asking in a step one is, hey, do you want to hop on a phone call? I'd love to chat. Um, that's not the type of question that you want to be implementing for the most part. Um, as a solo question, it's obviously useful as a call to action because your end goal will be to have those conversations, but you want to give them something that they can actually respond to uh, if they don't want to hop on the phone call, if the information that you've uh, provided them is not specific enough or relatable in any way, um, they will just ignore you. The more specific your questions get, the more likely that someone's going to bite and engage with you that way. And I think also, if you look at it, I mean, especially if you're doing like cold outbound. So if these are contacts that you're reaching out to that they've never heard from you before, so they probably don't, don't even know who you are, mm -hmm. um, you know, asking some questions that are not when are you available for a quick call? Like I said before, it, it really is going to work to get that dialogue and conversation going. So a lot of times people will see an email from someone they don't know. And you kind of need to be prompted to respond to that email. You know, mm -hmm. um, just saying, hey, when you're available for a quick chat, a lot of people are like, I don't even know this person. You know, I'm not going to be so quick to hop on a quick chat with them. Right. So it just really works to open those lines of dialogue and get some familiarity between the prospect and the person who is sending those emails to them. Yeah, 100 percent. The idea behind this specific structure, um, the manual touch point and then the first three step thread is to build trust. Uh, we've implemented this initial touch point to help get the ball rolling. They know we are a person. Now we engage with those probing questions and then we're slowly going to elaborate further and further to build up to the point where they're going to be more comfortable clicking on a link to an external website, downloading some sort of attachment, hopping on that phone call. If we just send them a massive novel of information and then end it with, hey, let's have a chat they're not going to get past the first two to three sentences. They're just gonna ignore it, delete you, potentially block the address. So you wanna, you wanna be a little bit more kind of cautious with how you're approaching um, people, especially because automated emails um, have a lot of tells. So again, you wanna try to get away from those more common archetypes and get as uh, specific and unique as you can. For step two, uh, this is where we go into the how of everything. A lot of the people will simply um, stay at, at claiming that they can help with a specific thing without going into any details. Um, this, is a, this is an email. Uh, they have no reason to really believe any of your claims. So the more detail you can provide, the more you're establishing how uh, experienced you are in this particular field. You've worked with people before, you're the type of person that other people want to work with. So you're, you're, you're fitting that professional uh, image that you're creating in their mind. Uh, and you're going to be talking about how you're going to help specific points and actions that you're going to take uh, by providing them examples of previous uh, experiences you've had with other clients, um, other services that you've provided uh, whatever it takes to 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 get to that point of uh, creating that ideal image in the the prospect's mind. Um, so here again, you just want to establish uh, previous work examples, um, as many details as you can. I recently worked with so and so, and I performed A, B, and C. 
to accomplish this result. I'd love to do the same for you. Let's talk and uh, see if we can work something out. And again, you want to word and contextualize your sentences in a way that you would be comfortable speaking them. Uh, if you can read your copy like you're just doing a radio ad, uh, you probably need to make some changes. Um, again, just regular everyday language is going to be extremely relatable. Um, a, a very common hang up that I find in conversations I have with clients is um, if you're reaching out to very high level management, you automatically assume that you need to create incredibly formal letters. Um, that's not the case. They are still regular people. They just happen to have a cushy job. Um, so they will still be able to relate to everyday language. Um, you can formalize your messaging a little bit, but don't be afraid to uh, speak naturally. And um, can I hop in here really quickly? And I'm afraid to hop in now because I'm just looking and my dog is out of the window. Looks like, <laughs> looks like he's going to bark at something. So I'll say it quick. Um, I remember a couple of years ago, I, I was reading up on, you know, just, you know, how to configure these sequences and whatnot. And, and I read that for people who utilized like a quick use case or case study, Josh, kind of like how you mentioned, you know, like an example, like I worked with, you know, company ABC, we were able to increase productivity by 30%. Um, those emails where there was a case study or use case and a follow-up got a 30% higher open rate than those who did not. So something to think about. Yeah, absolutely. And to that point, um, you don't want to just say, hey, here's a use case that mm -hmm. I think you'd be interested in and then provide a link because yeah. um, that's you're, you're still asking for quite a bit. They need to trust you enough to engage with that link and then follow whatever steps to get the information that they're looking for. Um, if you are going to include a link and you don't want to provide all of the detail, try adding in one or two sentences about what they can expect when they do click the link. That way, again, you're still setting the stage, you're warming them up as opposed to just kind of providing this random link. And for all they know, it could be leading anywhere. Um, it's all about building trust and think of it from the perspective of if you received this email, you don't know who the person is yet. Um, they seem legit, but I'm not entirely comfortable with clicking on anything that they're giving me. So you want to, again, just baby steps, drip feed to getting to that point where whatever you send, they'll click right away. Which brings us to step three. Um, so again, just a little bit of a refresher. You're starting very concise context opener with some specific questions about how to address problems. Step two is how you are going to help them solve those problems. And then step three, we're gonna elaborate another step further. You've been on calls before, you've had clients, you've been around the block, you are now going to get ahead of the conversation and start addressing some of the common questions that come up when you've gone through this process before. Again, you're establishing experience, you're establishing that professionalism, um, if you answer questions that they were going to ask you anyway before they even had the chance to, they're immediately going to think like, oh, yeah, this person knows what they're talking about. They're the type of person that I would want to hop on a call because I'm not going to be wasting my time. Um, so this is generally the FAQ segment. You can talk about pricing. If you're very kind of rigid in your pricing structure, you can talk about specific values. Um, if you don't mind the flexibility in having th those conversations about pricing, mention how you're willing to uh, kind of bargain there. Um, anything else as far as perceived bonuses? Um, it could be something that you do offer to every single person, or it can be something specific on specific tiers. Um, using Reply as an example, we have the client success team. Uh, we are willing to hop on calls with people and walk them through sequences. I help optimize settings to connect integrations whatever you'd like. Uh, whether that's something we offer to everybody or only specific clients is besides the point. Our sales team can leverage that idea and then use that as a perceived bonus to help increase engagement rates. Uh, they're more likely to interact with something if they think they're getting a little bit extra. 
So obviously this is going to be very unique depending on whatever uh, service product, whatever it is that you're, you're working with, but anything that you can think of that would fall into that kind of category, I think this is a great place to include. So you're capping things off with a little bit of an incentive for that engagement. In that way, with all three of these steps together, they should have a very clear picture of what they're in for to work with you. And then you can let a little bit of breathing room settle in so that they have time to do their research. They have time to engage with you. And then we're gonna re-up with a brand new thread, maybe a week, week and a half later. Yeah, and I wanted to touch on that really quickly. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe you were gonna bring this up after you kind of walk through the steps. So I wanted to touch on the delay in between each, e mm -hmm. between each email that goes out. Um, because I know typically, um, you know, like as you can see right here, like the first three are closer together. And then you'll see like that step five, that new thread is pretty much a week later and then a week between those ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is the idea behind keeping these first three. I like to send them within a week and a week and a, or a week and a half of each other. That way you're not being too persistent where they're going to be upset with you and annoyed that you're kind of spamming their inbox. Uh, but you're also not letting enough time pass where they're gonna completely forget about you. Um, this is kind of the sweet spot. You can play around with specific dates if you want it to be slightly faster or a little bit longer. Uh, I think within 10 days is usually the, the best area um and you can make these adjustments on the fly so if you're kind of halfway through your list and you want to speed things up a little bit you can make those changes at any point um but uh, the idea is you want to send these messages within relatively quick succession so they're getting this image in their mind and not enough time is going to pass where it's just completely um, out of the out of the picture so to speak um, I've added a call step at the end, um, just because this was the best place I could put it. A lot of people will arbitrarily place a call step in the middle of the sequence. Um, I don't think that's necessarily the best way to go about it. Uh, most of the time, if I'm getting a call from a, from a number that I don't immediately recognize, or I'm not expecting a call, I'm usually not going to pick it up. Uh, and I don't think I'm special in that in that sense um so arbitrarily calling people uh without any sort of um uh, mindfulness of their own schedule can lead to actually annoying people what if they're in the middle of a call and then you happen to to be trying to drop them a voicemail or get in touch with them you may have valuable information for them but now you've kind of set off on the wrong foot and you've potentially ruined that that sale um, so instead of arbitrarily placing a call in the middle of your steps, I like to set my calls based on interaction. Um, so if you go to the people tab within your sequences, you'll be able to see a column called views and you can click on that and it'll automatically sort your contacts by highest engagement. Um, you can look at that and then call people ad hoc based on if they've opened your emails a set number of times. That way, you're far more likely to get hits on the calls that you're making rather than sit through your list of potentially hundreds of contacts and your morale's just getting shot because everybody's either ignoring your call or immediately telling you to go away. Um, no, so this way, you're just optimizing your chances. No, absolutely. I mean, especially with a call step, you always want to make sure that you, with that call, you're bringing value to that call. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I've seen a lot is, you know, maybe step two is a call and that step three, there's a follow-up email and it, it's essentially, you know, I left you a voicemail two days ago. Have you had a chance to see my previous email? Mm -hmm. So like, I mean, even in that follow-up email behind that call, there's really not a lot of value there. There's really no new information that's coming. And, you know, one of the things that I like to think about when I'm kind of curating a sequence is, you know, creating it like I'm building out a story. So each step that I create, especially with the emails is like, I want to include some new information that's building upon something that I'd previously sent to them. Yeah, and to that same point, you can, you notice that we're trying to give completely different information at every stage so far. Um, if you ever find yourself at the point where the only thing you have left to say is, hey, did you get my previous emails? If you're still interested, let me know. Your sequence is over at that point. 
Um, if you're yeah. just reiterating that over and over again, or kind of going back to the well and repeating some of the same things, um, there's diminishing returns to the number of steps you can include. And while there are many reasons why someone may not engage and they're not all directly related to them not being interested, um, you should know when to end and maybe re-engage a month later with some fresh information, a little, a little bit of time passed. You don't wanna be so persistent to the point where you're annoying your contact list uh, instead of providing them actual value. Again, the entire idea is to provide them with a service or a product that they need um, rather than bully them into getting what you want. Um, back to the call point. Um, if you are leaving a very simple voicemail and just saying, hey, I sent you a message, um, feel free to hit me up whenever the time is great. Uh, you are doing one thing. You may not be adding in any new value, but you're doing something very similar to what the initial LinkedIn step is. You're reminding them of the fact that this is a manual touch point. So there is some value in including that at a certain point, but you can also just implement another Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever the case is um, at that step instead, uh, as opposed to kind of calling everybody on your list. Uh, I know I've, I've been there, I've done the cold calling thing. And at the end of the day, if you don't have any hits or you're, you're not successful because just nobody picked up, um, you start to feel that on, on yourself. And then you're less inclined to kind of want to continue doing it. So from just a pure morale perspective, um, capitalizing on the engagement is going to help you focus and you're far more likely to interact with people that actually want to speak with you. For the final two steps here, uh, this is going to be a little bit of a, uh, a re-up. We are going to start a brand new thread fresh from the previous one we sent them a week, a week and a half ago. And we're going to not necessarily go through all of the steps that we already did, but we're going to use some of those same concepts. Uh, we don't want to reintroduce ourselves from scratch because we have to work under the assumption that they did see our previous messages. Uh, but we want to implement ideas from steps two and three. Um, really hone in on the how you're going to help and try to use a different example or use case. Uh, the more different and unique perspectives you can hit on, the more likely you are to land on something they specifically need. And that way, they're going to engage. Um, if you are going to be reusing some of your value propositions, uh, I think the perceived bonuses is always a good one. Um, we don't like the idea of consistently pushing discounts, uh, sales, things like that, because you're, you're trapping yourself with very common terminology, and then you're going to be more likely to be perceived as spam. Uh, these are terms that are not going to net you into spam folders, just that are perceived as spam from readers. Um, so you want to try and stay away from that kind of language, but it is undeniable uh, that those kind of value props will work. So re-upping with, uh, with a little bit of that flavor is a very good idea. You can continue this new thread for as long as you'd like, as long as you have new and unique information to convey. Again, once you get to the point where you're talking about the exact same thing you talked about in a previous step, chances are you want to end it very shortly after that. Um, so between steps five and six here, there can be a couple more. Again, it all depends on how much more value you can come up with as far as your content is concerned. Your final step, this is going to be your last attempt at making that sale. And this one you want to be very tonally distinct from the rest of your messages. Um, while we're still going for that very um, kind of friendly conversational style throughout our entire sequence, this one's going to be the most personality based. We had a goal with all of our previous steps um, at every single point. Now we just want the sale. Um, so you can be a little bit tongue in cheek. You can be a little bit sarcastic. You want the personality to shine here because they may look at this one and then recontextualize everything else they read. Oh, 
this is really an actual person. Maybe I'll go and take a look back at some of the other messages and see what I missed. Um, one of the most outlandish examples that I can, can recommend is, uh, or not recommend, but uh, examples that I can, can tell you about is uh, someone mentioned that there was a squirrel living in their attic and they literally took pictures of it and then added them to this final step. Uh, all of the previous messages that they sent out before that were quite professional to the point using the use cases, da 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 da, -da. Uh, But this one was kind of out of left field. Uh, they were still including information related to the sale, the process, or the service that they were willing to provide. Um, but then they were just saying like, hey, yeah, this is also happening to me. I'd love to have a conversation with you. So it's just adding a more grounded element to the um the whole ordeal and giving them something to relate to i guess outside of just trying to get their money um you don't have to send people pictures of squirrels uh but the idea is you just want it to be as distinct and unique compared to the rest of your messages as possible so josh i'm curious did you ever see what the stats were on that email uh, they were actually quite good. His, his people were responding. I don't know if he actually made any conversion, but his open rate, or sorry, his response rate went from around like a, a five percent to around nine percent. Um, okay, which is which is pretty good for cold emails. Um, maybe, maybe people like squirrels. Yeah, I like squirrels. <laughs> okay. cute. So yeah, I can't I can't speak to how many people he sold with the squirrel concept, but he definitely got people engaged that way. Um, but yeah, so again, the final uh, for your Hail Mary, you just want this to be very distinct, very unique. Um, try to be you as well. Um, I have run into situations where people have asked me to write a message for them, uh, giving them a specific example, and then they ended up using that exact email that I wrote for them. They got some calls, but they were not the person that wrote the email. They, they were not the, the, the thing that got the prospect engaged. So they couldn't necessarily um, continue on with that persona. So you don't wanna to pretend to be somebody that you're not and then hop on a phone call and then kind of have that conversion dwindle. Uh, so do try to still be you, just be more you, if that makes sense. And I think it's really interesting. You know, I think a lot of times just the mindset, when you think about, you know, creating a sequence that's gonna to go to you know, maybe a list of 50 contacts versus just writing a one-off email to one person. There almost seems to be a block when it comes to creating content. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's one thing to sit there and, you know, write a one-off email, but for some reason, when you think of this sequence you have to write, like there's something about it, like you, you start thinking about changing your normal vocabulary to sound a certain way and your verbiage mm -hmm. and things like that. And so what I always say is, you know, take the sequence out of the equation, like try not to think about it as you're writing a sequence and you're going to have a bigger audience. Like think about your writing, maybe a certain set of emails or series for, you know, one person that you're trying to get in contact with and engage with. I feel like that takes away a lot of the, the nervousness or that, that kind of mental block when it comes to writing content. Yeah. 100%. Just, just try to be again, that conversational, write your emails as if you were speaking to someone face to face um obviously you can make any grammatical corrections that you need to um but you you have conversations all the time so writing an email shouldn't be any different um with all of that this is generally the idea that you want to stick with um obviously if you're if you're using a very specific use case you're not going for cold emails um you can be a little bit warmer uh, you can be a little bit more pointed with your information. You don't have to drip feed it as slowly if you're working with people that you have some sort of familiarity with. Um, but I do think keeping that conversational style consistent throughout, regardless of use case, is going to be key. The other thing that I want to talk about here is this is going to be your base sequence. Um, what happens when they get through everything? Do you just give up? Um, and the answer is not necessarily, you don't want to beat a dead horse. Uh, so if there's, if you've gone through six, seven, eight steps, somebody hasn't engaged with you, give it a break, uh, but set up follow-up sequences where you can transition people to a month or two down the line. And maybe you've provide, you've come up with new value propositions in the meantime, 
and you can give them some brand new information or recontextualize some of the information that you've used previously. But yeah. this does tie into our trigger system. Um, yeah, so and just um, and quickly before you hop into triggers, Josh, mm -hmm. um, what I typically recommend, you know, after that campaign is wrapped up, like really looking at the stats and seeing how people were engaging. So if, for example, you have contacts who, you know, maybe have viewed the emails nine or more times, that re-nurturing sequence is going to look different than maybe a re-nurturing sequence that maybe you're going to send to people who didn't even open the initial emails. You know, anyone who didn't open those, those emails that you sent, you could essentially segment them, maybe utilize a trigger, but maybe change the subject line to maybe something that's a bit more engaging that might catch their attention and get them to open that email. Whereas the people who have viewed the emails nine or 10 times, like Josh said, if you have a new value proposition or maybe there's been some sort of addition or new feature to your program that you think they'd be interested in, then you can send those people new information. So really look at that engagement and create those re-nurturing sequences based on what they did with that previous campaign. Yeah, that's, that's an extremely good point. This is the page that you're going to want to be looking at and the view count column is uh, really where you're gonna wanna spend a lot of time. Um, again, clicking on any of these is going to automatically sort your list based on highest engagement and then you can go through that uh, and then you can set up different filters based on that type of engagement. So you can use view count as your metric. So views more than, let's just say five arbitrarily. Um, you can save this filter and then create one, two, three follow-up sequences for different levels of engagement. And then if you go to settings and hop down to triggers, you can create actions based on specific um, conditions and then automatically have those people move into your follow-ups whenever they meet specific thresholds. Um, so we use triggers to move people into dedicated follow-ups internally, um, but you can set something up for, let's go contact open sequence email. If they viewed more than yeah, we'll do five times again. We can move them to a more dedicated sequence, or we can just add them to a list that'll dynamically be updating as people meet these thresholds. And then you can manually move people over if you want to be a little bit more hands on with that. Um, you can even push to a different owner if you have a team that's going to be taking care of different uh, pipelines and things like that. There's a lot of flexibility that comes along with the triggers that you don't normally get with the more traditional step one, step two, step threes. Uh, so this takes a lot of the babysitting out of your, your sequences. Uh, and there are quite a few different options you can also work with. Um, if you have specific links at key points in your sequences, um, you can use the clicked on a link trigger to move them to a dedicated sequence with more information based on what they would see on that web page or whatnot. Uh, if someone responds to you in a positive fashion, you can move them to a dedicated follow-up and you can set up a secondary follow-up for people that respond in a uh, negative fashion, not interested. Maybe they say that they're busy right now, but they'd love to hop on later on. You can set up out of office type follow-ups um, sequences. The limits, are, the possibilities are endless. You can be as kind of uh, intricate as you want or as simple as you want. Uh, the triggers just allow you to add that extra layer to, to get a little more oomph out of your, your messaging. Um, but yeah, I think now would be a great time to open it up for any questions anybody has uh, related to content. If you have a specific use case in mind, uh, feel free to let us know and, and we can kind of walk through some stuff. Um, so there's no questions as of right now. However, um, a question I get a lot is, you know, what are your thoughts on, you know, having three links in an email? And Josh, I'm sure you get this one too. Um, so my response is always going to be that I don't like that idea. Um, and there's two reasons. I always recommend one to two links per email maximum. And the number one reason is deliverability purposes. If you have four or five links in an email plus link tracking turned on, it could result in your emails landing in a promotions tab, spam folder. It may not go to that inbox and could cause deliverability issues down the road. Um, another reason I don't like multiple links in email, because if you put yourself in the shoes of the person who's reading the email, 
no one is going to take the time to get redirected, you know, three, four, five times to different websites. One to two, they might, but anything beyond that, they're not going to, they're simply not going to take the time. You know, most people, when they're reading emails, they skim the first three quick paragraphs and then they don't really read the rest. So, you know, making sure that all of your pertinent information is at the beginning of the email, but again, you know, keeping the links one to two um, is usually ideal. Um, yeah, following up on that line of thought, um, if you add in like three different links and you have links tracking enabled in your settings, um, first off, we only track click-through rate. Uh, the number of times someone has interacted with the links you've included in your messages. We do not break down specifically which link was clicked on and how many times that link was clicked on. So if you're looking for more pointed information there, the system doesn't currently provide that. Um, and you're shooting yourself in the foot as far as where you're going to land. Um, that's also why we're using the threaded approach. Um, if you want to start, if you want to use links or attachments, uh, heavily use HTML based content, starting off with that very specific question based opener is a great way to ensure you land in that primary inbox and then anything you follow up with is dedicated to follow suit. Um, it's also a lot easier to set up triggers if you have one single link at dedicated points. Um, and then move them to those follow-up sequences rather than just filling your content with links. And then your follow-up trigger could essentially lead them anywhere. Um, so you really want to be careful with how you're using it uh, from a deliverability standpoint and from an internal kind of uh, system standpoint. Um, I right, have to um, plug my phone in or my computer in. <laughs> um, well, we have a question from Gavin, um, are there samples of best practices for messages? Um, yes, there are. Um, so probably by the end of the week, we'll send out this recording, but we can also send out um, the content that you see here. Um, so obviously these are not samples, but it's just really kind of focusing on what you should be including in those emails in terms of context. Um, but in addition to that, if you go to our blog at reply.io, um, there are a lot of blog entries um, about you know, subject lines, follow up specifically. Um, and there are some really good samples there as well. So a couple of places to go. Um, but yeah, our blog site on reply.io, and then we'll send these out at the end of the week. And then also, um, can you please go back to show the view filter? Um, so Josh, as soon as you get your laptop plugged in, if you wanna go back there, because um, you're sharing your screen. Um, and Jennifer, is there anything specifically that you want us to go through on the view filter or do you just kind of want to see what that looks like for multiple views? Um, so you'll, you'll find the add filter option either on the people page within your sequences or on the main people page. Just go add filter, select the property, views, and then you can play around with the specific value. And, and one thing to note, um, if you are going to save the filter, I'd always recommend giving it a name where it says new name at the top. Um, mm -hmm. When you are utilizing filters, if you hit apply, it's going to be a temporary filter until you navigate away from the page. If you hit save, it will be a permanent filter. It will update as your campaigns progress. And that's exactly where you can find them on that more drop down right there. Yeah. And again, you can add multiple properties as well. You don't have to just stick with one. Mm -hmm. um, so if you yeah. wanted you count as well as anything else that you think is going to be valuable, um, for example, like you can make sure that you're exempting replies. So people that you're already engaging with, you want to make sure that you're not doubling up on any of that. So you can set replies exactly zero, view count, whatever threshold that you think is going to be indicative of, of interest. Um, and do keep in mind that whatever properties that you use here, uh, the system works with and logic, not or. So it's only going to bring you people that meet all of the requirements, not just a combination of them. So do keep that in mind when setting these up. Um, and one quick note, just about content in general, um, keep in mind, it's always a good idea to change out your content from time to time. Um, if you have, 
the same content consistently going out for long periods of time, it could again lend to deliverability issues. Um, I always like to talk about deliverability, it's my favorite thing. Um, but, you know, changing up that content, keeping it fresh. And one thing to keep in mind too, you know, what may have worked, you know, six months ago, a year ago, may not be the right approach now. You know, more and more people are using, you know, some sort of automation. Um, some sort of sales engagement tool. And eventually a lot of those emails start to look the same because people start to catch on to what works. And then you get to a point where, you know, I can open my inbox right now and I can look at an email and say, huh, that's automated email and I delete it. So you want to keep your content fresh. You want to stay on top of things that are working really well. Cause like I said, things do tend to change. You want to make sure that your emails are going to be the ones that are standing out amongst the rest in someone's inbox. For sure. And, and kind of speaking to that trends topic, uh, subject lines are a feature that we didn't really touch upon um, that always go through kind of ups and downs. This type of subject line is one of the most commonly used, but I use it here as an example because it's also one of the most effective. Um, the idea here is you want to imply some sort of partnership between uh, them and yourself. So utilizing first name is a way to again reach out to the specific person on the other side of the screen rather than relate your e your email to the company at large um, using the real world example if you go outside go to your mailbox and you see to homeowner or to you specifically you're far more likely to open the the message that's dedicated to you rather than the one generically titled um, so you can move away from this specific template, um, but I do like the idea of implementing first name. If you don't have first name, the company can work. It's just slightly less effective um, to really get that, that, that sense of dedication across. Um, all right, um, we have a question. Um, it's not really related to content. Um, it's more related to LinkedIn steps. So we could probably answer this one quickly and then hop back into content. Um, can you link multiple LinkedIn accounts in reply to choose which account views the profile in your sequence step? Uh, you can. So the same way that you can set up multiple email addresses in your settings, you can set up multiple LinkedIn accounts. Uh, and then if you have a LinkedIn account enabled, there will be a second section underneath emails for your LinkedIn um, logins. You can only use um, one LinkedIn per sequence, but you can technically have multiple LinkedIn accounts connected to your login. Um, do keep in mind that if you have a team and you're connecting the same LinkedIn account to multiple team members, you will run into problems with LinkedIn limitations, uh, where you can set a maximum threshold uh, of 400 emails per day um, with base uh, accounts. With LinkedIn, you can only perform 100 unique actions per day, which is accumulation of uh, view profile connection uh, requests, messages as well as any liked posts. So if you go over that and try to game the system by connecting multiple instances of the same thing, uh, you're only hurting your own potential. Uh, if you get blocked on LinkedIn, you're kind of, again, shooting yourself in the foot there. So you want to be as um, cautious and respectful of the limitations that the systems put in place. They're there for your benefit, uh, not necessarily for, for theirs. Yeah. And my advice to anyone who is using LinkedIn steps um, in their sequences is to really save those LinkedIn steps for sequences that are going to be highly tailored and highly focused. So, you know, utilize LinkedIn on a sequence for maybe 40 or 50 contacts. Maybe they're all in the same industry position, whatever the case may be, as opposed to a sequence where you have, you know, 500 sequences, uh, contacts, sorry, not sequences, 500 contacts, and it's more of a very general 
um, sequence that you're creating, just to make sure you're staying in line with those limits. And we recommend that with any sequence that you create. Um, you know, we're not fans of, you know, throwing a thousand people into a general sequence and just kind of crossing your fingers, hoping that someone's going to reply. Always take the time before hitting go and, you know, research your contact base, research who they are, um, and then create a sequence that is going to resonate with them because you're going to see much better results on that sequence um, than if you don't do that. Yeah, segmentation is key. Like mm -hmm. we, we speak about um, talking about how you're going to assist. If you're providing a service that works with a number of different industries, the example that you're going to want to use here should be unique for the different segments that you have. Um, so don't try to just cram everybody into one general sequence and then add like 10,000 people to it. Um, sure, you may get some conversions, but you're also missing out on a ton of potential there. Um, so yeah, take the time to break your mm -hmm. lists down, find the common threads. And then if there's a big enough subgroup, make a subsequence for it. Yeah, absolutely. I had um, a customer once who had 99,000 people in a sequence. Wow, <laughs> that's a lot. Yeah, it, it, it yeah. also, it, it just takes too long um yeah just spe speaking to the limits that i that i just mentioned you can only send so many emails per day using a system like reply um it's automatically well, going to backlog people that haven't been touched and you're just going to take years to get through all of that well at 400 emails per day um the last time we talked um he's no longer a customer of ours but um we were at month nine um, and it was just like a one step sequence and we'd only kind of cracked a fraction of the people. And as I, I told him so many times, you know, break up this list, let's break it down, break it down. But sadly, he did not listen to me. Um, yeah. And at the yeah, end so of the don't day, do that. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> yeah. And to that point, like at the end of the day, systems like reply are simply tools. They're not going to be the cure all um, yeah. for, for your outreach woes. We do a lot to help facilitate, um, your outreach but if you're not going to take the time and really cater to your particular audience you're doing yourself a disservice the tool is only as good as the, the hand that wields it so absolutely uh, take the time put in the work and then eventually you'll reap the rewards absolutely um well it doesn't look like there's any more questions um josh is there anything else that you wanted to add because if not i, I feel like we can we can give everyone back 10 minutes of their day uh, I think the only thing that we didn't speak about is just general practices as far as the scheduling. And this will be rather brief. Uh, by default, most of your sequences will default to Monday to Friday, nine to five local time, usually Eastern Pacific. Um, we find that sending emails in the morning to around the lunch period tends to work best because people, they get in, they do the majority of their work uh, early on in the day. And then the closer it gets to quitting time, kind of you lose interest and then you just want to get the hell out of there. Um, so taking common human <laughs> interactions into consideration, uh, something like seven to around one, two o'clock tends to work pretty well. Uh, you'll find information on scheduling to be vastly different depending on where you look some people will swear by sending on weekends uh we personally don't um but the the more you know about your particular audience the more you can play around with this but generally seven to around one two o'clock is is typically pretty solid and you also do get higher engagement in the middle of the week rather than the beginning of the end because friday you're going into the weekend you want to get out of there as soon as possible and then Mondays, you're, you don't really want to work. And uh, again, you just want to get out of there as soon as possible. So that, that's why we have these sessions on Tuesdays, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys can show up. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Tuesdays through Thursdays is usually peak work hours. Um, so we've increased, as you can see here, just a little bit because people are more engaged. Um, but again, we're still sticking to that early set times. I will say that for me personally, I find that Wednesdays are the best days. Wednesdays, I'll send out a sequence and the replies, they just seem to roll in on Wednesdays, like one after the other. 
Yeah, it, it's it's kind of like a wave. You're looking for that typical bell curve, right? Yeah. You're, you're going to start yeah. a little bit low, but you're going to increase over time, and then you're going to drop down as the weekend continues. And it just goes in waves more. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, I mean, I think we can wrap up. Um, Josh, as always, thank you for your expertise. Thank you. Um, for and me. <laughs> and uh, thank you for everyone for joining us today. And I know there's a bit of a glitch with the recording today, but it, it is being recorded right now. Um, this will go on to Reply's YouTube channel. Um, we will also send it out by the end of the week um, with um, these steps right here, just with kind of like the context that Josh went over, just so you guys could refer to it. Um, but again, we do have some examples um, on Reply's blog. So just go to reply.io and you can click on the blog um, and they're all right there. Um, as always, if you guys have any questions, let us know. You can also reach out to our support team. Josh, do you wanna show them where that is? Woohoo! Um, via live chat, the response time is usually, it says three to five minutes, I think, um, under five minutes. Um, usually they're one to two. Um, so that's a really great resource for you as well if you have any questions. Um, and yeah, we'll be doing another session in a couple of weeks. I don't think we've narrowed down the topic just yet, um, but as soon as we do, you guys will know. Absolutely. Thank you guys for sticking with us this whole time. And we hope to see you again on uh, future webinars. Yeah. Bye guys. Hey guys, bye.